is losing my religion part two, the false doctrine of the hellless gospel. I'm going to play these clips of these two guys. So um, I'm going to let you hear what they said, and then I'm just going to use the word to uh, break it down. All right. Amen. This first guy is Tim Rogers. Y'all have been sold a lie. Yeah. You've been, been bamboozled. All of that stuff is a fairy tale. To believe in hell means you have to believe in Santa Claus. I don't care how you cut it. Hell is an imaginary place. Come on, Pastor. And I was taught. That if anything that does not have an explanation must be imagination. <laughs> so that's why you can talk about a hell that you don't know nobody went through for a billion years. Ain't nobody ever came back and told you that they were hot. For a billion years, ain't nobody ever came back and told you that they up and yonder singing around in a choir. <laughs> Pastor, tell it, not that you back. Well, no, I and I didn't, come to, I didn't come for you to agree with me. I know I done made a lot of y'all salty, but I don't care. That's right. Yeah. On out. I didn't come for you to agree with me. Well, where's hell, Pastor Tim? Hell is what you create. Come on, Pastor. Come on, man. That's why when you read the Old Testament, Hell wasn't under the earth. When you read the Old Testament, hell was on the earth. When you read the Old Testament, heaven wasn't beyond the sky. When you read the Old Testament, heaven was in the Garden of Eden. Heaven was Canaan. Pastor Preach, man. It was a literal place. That ain't what I came to honor. What I came to tell you is, you're waiting to go to hell. And you've really turned your life into a living, living hell. Oh, Why? Because you have become a worshiper of death. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm coming, but I know this is business for y'all. But I'm, I apologize. This is my community. And this is that. This is that. See, you make money off the day. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to keep them out of your funeral home. So if y'all would rush me. If y'all would stand there like y'all ready for me to hurry up, and in all due respect, I'm trying to keep them out of your funeral home. I'm trying to keep them, you from embalming them, so I know you're ready to go. But if you can just pause a minute and let me keep some of these folks out of your business. He said a whole lot more, and I'll go through some of the things that he said, and I'll let you know what he said if you couldn't understand him. This next guy is probably the greatest apostate uh, that our world has ever seen. This is Carlton Pearson. This is his response after John Key uh, alert, uh, alerted him of what had, what had happened. Hey, folks, I got, um, I got several emails today or texts from people who uh, had seen uh, a young man named Pastor Rogers, Tim Rogers from Arkansas, preaching apparently in a funeral, uh, making some pretty strong statements about hell that obviously unnerved a lot of people, and it's gone viral. Actually, I got one from John P. Key saying, this is one of my sons, uh, pray for him. I plan to reach out to him. In fact, I've texted him to, uh, to help shore him up. I understand where he's coming from. Many of you know that I've been preaching a hellless Christianity or a hellless faith-based consciousness for a while. He's in his 30s. He's a young man, and, and but Christians have just been vicious on on the net. And some of the meanest people I know are religious folk. I think Christians and religious folk, church folk, can be mean because they're mad, and they're mad because they think God has an anger management issue. In fact, God is so mad that he's created this customized torture chamber that we call hell, where he's going to send uh, 
billions of people to be tortured and tormented, weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, as the scripture uh, alludes, uh, for eternity even though the scripture also says his mercy endures forever. This young man is being lambasted, though many of us and many people are supporting him, love him, understand, or at least even if they don't agree with him, they're curious about his posture. So I'm going to work with him and reach out to him and love on him, and I'm asking others to do the same. But I would say to those of you who have not done the research, you may have read a few scriptures about the, the actual word hell does not appear in both Old or New Testament. Jesus used the word Gehenna, which is a Hebrew word meaning valley of Hinnom. Ge means gully, gorge, or valley of Hinnom. He's referring to something that existed several hundred years, at least 500 years before he ever walked the earth. And it was the town dump of Israel called Gehenna. And it was on the southeast side of the old city. I've been there 12 times, and it doesn't even exist anymore. But in those days, it was a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week burning of garbage, of corpses of foreigners or slaves uh, or of animals. And, uh, and they had slaves in those days, like we've had over here in this country. Well, they were basically indentured servants. But they threw them, and you couldn't be a Roman citizen, and you couldn't be a Jew to be thrown there. But he was making a reference, and the people to whom he was referring about that fire it was a metaphor for, uh, the, for, for, for the burning pain of feeling separated from God. That's an illusion. You can't really be separated from God because we're made in the image and likeness of divinity. And part of our essence is divinity, bridging to our humanity. But most people don't know that. You've made it an article of faith. Listen to Dante's Inferno. And you've created this, concocted a man-made fear-based theology that makes God more of a monster. And it's time for us to reconsider. We've carried this for at least 2,000 years. Jews don't believe, most Jews don't believe in hell or life after this one. And even though Christianity is a Jewish religion, we've adopted this primarily when the, when the church moved to the, to the uh, west from the east to, to Rome. And we've concocted these fear-based theologies to keep and manipulate people. I don't believe in a God who would even create something as horrendous. That's worse than Hitler. At least Hitler's people, between 6 and 12 million people at some point, stopped hurting. They died. But what we're taught is that people will be tortured and tormented forever by a God whose mercy endures forever. The moral character of love is inconsistent with that kind of torment. I know you have scripture to base what you think is hell on, based on some of the descriptive language that even Jesus used in reference to that burning sensation uh, of, of the illusion of separation from God, which is impossible. You can no longer be separated from God, then you can be separated from air <laughs> that you breathe. So let's reconsider all of that. I stand with the young man. I believe that you should back off, especially if you haven't done the research. Study the language, study the word, not just the scripture, but the scripture, because I can prove if you look in my book, uh, God is not a Christian or the book, uh, the gospel of inclusion, I deal with how the words of hell have been inserted and how they, in modern translations, you don't even see that terminology anymore. So this is the 21st century. It's time to rethink this. Pastor Roger, I'm praying with you, standing with you, believing God for you and believing with you. You're young, you've got a great future, and a lot of us, they who are with you are probably greater than they who are against you. Only religious, arrogant, mean-spirited people will attack that way with the kind of vicious. Now, you can have a disagreement. You don't have to agree with him. You don't have to go along to get along. You're too mean. You're too angry. You're too paranoid. And it reminds me of the d days when I was casting devils out, and the devil would start screaming and cussing and fussing when it was just about to come out. I think y'all fixing to get your deliverance. That's what's happening. Some, that old religious spirit uh, is a disembodied, uh, unclean, unclean or unclear, non-distinct energy or entity that invi invades your thinking. And you can be free if you want to be free. Pastor Roger, hang tough, hang turf. We're going to come and see about you, big guy. And I know a lot of other people who really care. You can believe what you want to believe. Everybody has that freedom. But to be mean and mad about it and attacking the way only Christians do that. I've never seen, I've never been persecuted by the world, only by the church. The world's never persecuted me. The world embraces me. Like the scripture says about Jesus, sinners heard him gladly. And I'm not saying that everybody in the world is a sinner because that's a Jewish mentality. The, the Bible is written by Jews to Jews about a Jewish understanding about God. There are other understandings about God. I think all paths ultimately lead to God. I actually do. Jesus said, I am the way, but he's every way. I'm the route. 
and his consciousness. He didn't understand everything about himself. He had a little bigotry in him when he called the, the woman, uh, the Syrophoenician uh, uh, woman, a, a, a dog. And he evolved in his life. He was only 33 and a half when he died. I'm 65. Carlton Pearson, a steeped, uh, staunched, fourth generation classical fundamentalist, Pentecostal, pew jumping, devil thumping, Bible toting, Bible quoting Christian. If I can shift in consciousness, anybody on the planet can. I offer you to rethink what you believe, why you believe it, and how it affects the lives around you. I really care. God bless you. God be you. Mind your manners. All right, don't do that because that means you're mean. Yeah. So, you know, what we have here is a whole lot of psychology. Okay? He's good at it. He's practiced it. He's taught it. I've had preachers on major platforms tell me, that they have studied psychology or the art of getting, or the art of influence to spin things, to make people believe things. Because a lot of these guys believe that church people are the most gullible people that exist. Even Jim Jones and all these guys with Guyana, all these guys study psychology so that they could spin and flip things. And that's how he started this particular saying out. He started out first by dealing with how he came at everyone because I didn't like that. Okay. He came at everyone to declare that the church is angry or upset because of Tim Rogers message. Right now, I will say there are a lot of people that were disappointed. That's why I always tell you a fan is a true follower. Never be a fan of man because when man lets you down, a lot of these folks were angry because they like him or they were fans of him but we have to we can love people we can cheer people on but we have to keep that distance where when they cross the line all right brother right we ain't crying weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth because of a human being falling okay because we still have to keep going so we're not going to be fans of people to the point to where it affects us that way. But anyway, he declared that the church is angry. He summed in all of his language is the church because that's what these guys want to do. Because he lost his church, was kicked out of his church or kicked out of the denomination or the affiliation or whatever because of the message and he had to go underground or whatever, they are demonizing church. Okay, this is the same attack that Kurt Franklin did last year with the losing my religion. And this is the same attack that most gospel artists believe. They believe the gospel of inclusion. So they want to pull people out of the church and use their influence to lead people as their fans or their following. Y'all get it? Y'all understand that? He is using psychology. He is demonizing the opposition to better position himself as an authority or catalyst for bringing clarity. So if he keeps telling you how angry you are, eventually he feels that you're going to look to him to bring clarity to make you feel better. That's psychology. He wants to be the balance and bring harmony to the sides involved. So he wants to show that you're upset, then he wants to show the other side so he can be in the middle and say, hey, can't we just get along? We, can, we, don't, we don't have to be angry, but we can disagree. Remember he said that? However, you cannot bring harmony while standing against the word of God because the word of God does what? It never changes for us. So no matter what you're feeling and no matter how you have felt, the word of God doesn't change for us, but we must what? Conform to it. Second. Corinthians 11, 14 through 15 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself, the devil himself, is transformed into a good being. He can transform himself into an angel of light or a light bringer or someone that illuminates, brings clarity. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, that's what Tim Rogers, Kurt Frank, all these other guys, that's what they are. They're his ministers. If his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness 
whose end shall be according to their work. So he's saying the devil will transform himself as someone to bring clarity. So will his ministers. They'll transform themselves as ministers of righteousness. Carlton made sure he mentioned that John P. Key contacted him. Y'all saw him slip that in there. Matter of fact, John P. He wanted you to know because Andre Krause, Walter Hawkins, all these guys, Thomas Doris, all these guys believed inclusion because they wanted their lifestyle practice to be acceptable. So he made sure he included a gospel artist to let you know I've gone nowhere. These guys look to me. John Key texted him and asked him to pray. You gonna ask an inclusionist to pray? A heretic, an apostate? The only only reason you would ask him to pray is if you believe in him and what he preaches. Key was an advocate for Tone. Remember. Performing in the church even after he publicly announced he was a practicing homosexual. So we know what's going on here, Galatians 1 and 9. And as we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach or if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, that, that is written, let him be what? A curse. You know what an accursed thing is? You're just supposed to touch not the accursed or unclean thing. That means that you can't be in fellowship asking the accursed person to pray. Amen. And if I want to get something done, I ain't, I'm not asking an accursed person to lead the prayer. When I want to get something done, I'm standing as far away from your accursed self as I can. Right? Carlton tries to use God's mercy to insinuate that he does not punish Man, he has not read the Bible. He is not describing the God of the Bible. The biblical God, Jehovah, destroyed his enemies by fire in Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed them by fire. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. His mercy endures forever and he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroyed the wicked, the whole world with the flood. His mercy endured while the flood was happening. When the doors closed, his mercy endured. You know why his mercy endured? Because he took that believed in his righteousness with him. He destroyed tribe after tribe of Nephilim giants by empowering Israel to fight them in combat. God created a whole nation. People don't even understand the origin of Israel. Israel was an army. They were created to destroy Nephilims. Mixed breeds. Yeah, and I'm not talking about races, so don't go crazy with me. I'm talking about mixed breed Nephilim spirits. From the union of angels, from the union of fallen uh, sons and women, the offspring, they were created to fight and kill. God never told them to go in there and uh, show them some mercy. No, he said, go in there, don't just kill them, kill all this stuff, burn everything, don't leave anything. My mercy endureth forever. God has always destroyed his enemies and those that war against his righteousness. The whole battle is good versus evil. Joshua 7, 24 and 25. And this is Achan. Achan was one of the children of Israel. He's one of them, but he took the spoils that were supposed to be destroyed. He kept some of it, hid it in his tent. Let's see how the mercy of God handled this. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver that he hid, and the garments that he hid, and the wedge of gold that he took, took his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua asked them, said, why have you troubled us? The Lord, who, who's going to trouble you? Who, 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 who's going to trouble you? The one whose mercy endures forever, right? 
the Lord whose mercy endureth forever shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, burned them with fire, and they had stoned them after they had stoned them with stones. That's the God of the Bible. Thank you very much. That's the God I serve. That's why I'm not trying to get on his bad side. I'm trying to live right and do what he says. You can make your wife mad. You can make your, your daddy mad. You can make your friend, your boss mad. I don't want God mad at me. And ask me, do I know his mercy endureth forever? His mercy endureth forever. That's why he sent Jesus. So we don't have to... Hey, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I, I can't wait to the end to get to the Jesus part. I got to mix him all the way through it. We are, uh, this is what he said. We are, he said we are made in the image and likeness of divinity. There is divinity in us. And that is a lie. That is not biblical. We are not divine. We are not gods. We are not little gods. We are, look at somebody say, I'm a human. We are human. God loved what he made. He made us male and female. He didn't make male and female angels. He didn't make us male and female Nephilim. He didn't make us, he didn't make us gods, little gods. In the, nope, nope, nope. He gave us dominion as men and women. Look at somebody and say, I'm a human. So we're not made in the image or likeness of divinity. We are man made in the image and likeness. And image and likeness simply means our behavior on earth should reflect the behavior of the creator. We don't look like him physically because Moses couldn't even look at God. His, his human eyes could not handle what he would see because he wouldn't see the image of a man. We don't look like him physically, nor do we have his abilities. That's, but you know what? That's not what we were created to do. We were created to image him in the earth, represent him in the earth. We represent him in the earth, John 5 and 19. Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son, me, Jesus, can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son, what? What he's saying is in the earth, you see a human, but I'm representing God and doing what God wants me to do in the earth. Jesus' human form didn't look like his father's spiritual form. Okay, so then he calls hell Gehenna. And I hate when people do this because they're alluding to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was comparatively comparing hell with the burning trash, burning flesh of the Gehenna Valley, okay? The Gehenna Valley, Jesus preached about in the Sermon on the Mount, was a place of burning sewage, burning flesh, and garbage. Maggots and worms crawled through the waste, and smoke smelled pungent and sickening. This place was utterly filthy, disgusting, and repulsive to the nose and eyes. Gehenna presented such a vivid uh, image that Christ used it as the symbolic depiction of what? Hell, a place of eternal torment and constant uncleanness where the fires never cease burning and the worms never stop crawling, right? So when Jesus said, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, how could he be talking about Gehenna if this dude, Carlton, said he's been there 12 times and said it's not even there anymore? Okay, so if it's not even there anymore, Jesus said... No, he said, I'd rather, wait, 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 let me get his, his exact word. He said, if thy right I offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee one day, uh, uh, one of thy members shall perish and not thy whole body should be cast in hell. Okay, so if the hell he's talking about already stopped burning, then this scripture is a lie. Where the worm dieth not and the fire ain't. Hey man, look at somebody and say that's symbolism. I mean, can it be symbolism? He don't even really want you to pluck your own eye out. That's a hyperbole. He's saying, do something about your eye. Quit looking at what you shouldn't be looking at. He didn't mean literally go pluck it out. 
So you have to know when Jesus is speaking in hyperbole, but comparatively, he compares hell to the burning trash to give them a reference. So if they're looking at the burning trash, they're saying, that trash is pretty hot. Well, hell is hotter. Oh, well, then I probably need to live right. Amen. This dude right here. Jesus used Gehenna as the greatest or best revelation or understanding of what hell is like. In other words, the greatest revelation of hell on earth is a place of perpetual burning where, he, uh, where we sacrifice our children. In that regard, Jesus speaks of those who lead his little ones astray or being, uh, of being worthy of the fire of Gehenna. So the whole reason he's bringing it up is because we have a responsibility not to lead people astray. Because to Jesus, every false teacher is sacrificing those who follow them to Gehenna and making them twice the sons of hell as they are. Because what leaders do in moderation, what I always say, the followers of the sons of hell will do in excess. Pearson is gathering sons who will take his teaching of universalism even beyond what he teaches. Here we go, Matthew 23 and 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye come past sea and land just to make one disciple. Dude, you made a whole movie just to make some disciples. But when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Look at somebody and say, I believe the Bible. The Bible also speaks of the lake of fire. Look at somebody say, this is not a metaphor. The lake of fire, okay, is that Gehenna? Uh, Carlton? I don't think so. He only talks about Gehenna in that valley in, uh, descriptively during the Sermon of the Mount. All the rest of these references, what's the lake of fire? I'm sure he can explain that. Well, see, that was a swimming pool that somebody threw gas in. I don't know what he's talking about. This is not a metaphor. Pearson's lifestyle choices have caused him to lower the standards of God and God's behavioral commands to the standard of men. That's all it is. You've lowered God's standards to your standards. He is making room for sin and making unnatural affections approvable to God. But Matthew 25 and 41 says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye are cursed in the burning trash. We know it's not the burning trash because he uses the term ever. Didn't you say that trash has stopped burning? <laughs> Into everlasting what? Then he gives you a reference of why it was even created. Hell was created. It was prepared for the devil. And it's like, so the trash and worms was prepared for the Prepare for the devil, just the trash and the worms. Brother, please. He's telling you there's a place that I prepared for the devil and his angels for what they did. And if you are with them, you're going with them. Tim Rogers says that we have been sold a lie and all of that stuff. And I guess he's referring to the truth or whatever. All of that stuff is all of that stuff is a fairy tale. He doesn't make I mean, uh, I think he's referring to all the stuff about hell and heaven. He doesn't make a difference here in what is fiction and what is fact. So we really don't know what he was talking about. And why are you at a funeral doing this? I'll tell you. You want to know? I'll tell you. He's at a funeral doing this because this is the time where people are most open and vulnerable. He, this is psychological. I'm trying to tell you this is psychological. It was calculated. Now, he might not have calculated it like this, but the devil sure did. He knew that those people were hurting. And then we automatically don't want, I, I don't know what the person in the casket may have done, but we don't want to ever imagine that they are going to hell. So these people were vulnerable for you to tell them that there was no hell. To tell them that there is nothing after this. And he used that opportunity. That's why it happened at a funeral. It was very calculated by the devil. He doesn't make a difference here. So let's use the Bible to find the truth. Can we use the Bible? 
We must first establish, though. Let me establish this. I should have done this in the beginning, but let me establish this. The Bible is the authority. And we got to establish the Bible as the authority, as infallible, and as God's logic. Do we all believe that in here? When we do this, we can bring clarity to what is factual based on our faith in it. Okay? 2 Timothy 3 and 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. How much scripture? All, all of it. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, what I'm doing right now, for correction, what I'm doing right now, and for instructions in God's right alignment or to be right with God, his righteousness. Okay, so we're all on the same page here, right? We believe that the Bible can, can, can handle this. Amen? All right. To believe in hell means you have to believe in Santa Claus. That's what he said. But St. Nicholas was a real person. <laughs> Though he is not mentioned in the scriptures, but hell certainly is mentioned in the scriptures. Jesus preached more about hell than he did heaven. He even told the story of a rich man and a beggar that included hell. And the word hell there is not Gehenna. It's Hades. Talk about that later. He also warned people in his sermon about where they would spend eternity without him. Mark 9 and 45, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life than have two feet to be cast where? Into hell. And this is where he makes the comparison. Y'all, I'm not just talking about this trash. Because he says, into the fire that never shall what? Be quenched. Tim Rogers calls hell an imaginary place. Then he says, one of the dumbest statements I've ever heard a human say on, on, on the internet or in a sermon. He suggests that anything that doesn't have an explanation has to be imagination. That still got me scratching my head, brother. That, you know how they try to sound deep, but it don't make any sense? It's like, brother, you went so deep, Jesus pulled out a concordance. Wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Let's, let's see. And the reason why this don't make any sense is because God cannot be explained. He even said we see darkly right now as through a glass. We can't even use our eyes and our understanding to really understand God. He sent Jesus to bring understanding to who he was. But God himself, he can't be explained. He came from nowhere into nothing and made everything. Explain that. Our words can't even say it right. He came from nowhere into nothing and made everything. Our words don't even line up right with that. He's too great for our words. Brother, I don't understand. So you're talking about anything uh, that doesn't have an explanation has to be imagination. This cannot, God, uh, uh, God cannot be fathomed or understood in our limited human faculties. The Bible tells us also to cast down vain imaginations that exalt themselves above the knowledge or belief in God. And this includes his words. So look at somebody say, I'm casting down what these brothers said. 2 Corinthians 10 and 15, cast down imagination and every high thing. Brother, your imagine y'all are talking, trying to talk higher than God. Your understanding, you're saying the Bible is wrong and you are right. That's a vain imagination. Then he's, well, let me take that back what I said. This is the dumbest thing. He said, for a billion years, no one has come back and told you about hell. First of all, earth is not a billion years old. You've been watching too many dinosaur movies, <laughs> listening to dino doctors, paleontologists. Brother, no, the earth is not that old. Then he says, for a billion years, no one has come from heaven to tell you about it either. Luke 16 and 26, Abraham tells the rich man, brother, you can't come out of hell. But I got a message for my brothers. He said, brother, let them hear Moses and the prophet. You can't come back. He said, even if I would 
was going to let you come back. Between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. That's why nobody in a billion years have come back to tell you about <laughs> hell. There's a gulf fixed. No what the Bible just told us. Can't nobody come back? <laughs> Bruh. Tim also said, hell is what you create. But God is the creator of all dimensions, including the dimension of hell. Then he said in the Old Testament, hell was on the earth. And heaven was on the earth. I still haven't figured those out. Because in the Old Testament, hell is described as being under the earth or in the earth's center. Remember when Dathan, Coram, and Abiram were cast in, the ground opened up and swallowed them up. The Bible says on the earth, opened their mouth in Numbers 16 32, opened up her mouth. What were they doing? They were disobeying God's prophet. They had brought idolatry back and they were sacrificing their children to false gods again. And what did God do? You're not in Egypt. Y'all on my watch. So what did God do whose mercy endureth forever? He opened up the ground and swallowed up his own people, the Jews, the chosen ones. And the earth opened their mouth. And swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that pertain unto them went down how? Alive into the pit. And then this is letting you know they didn't come out through the bottom of the flat earth. That foolishness. It lets you know they were in the center of the spherical earth. And the pit, the earth did what? It closed upon them. In the New Testament, hell is depicted as a being as being a place that one descends to after death in the dimension of death. There is a dimension of death. The Bible calls it hell, grave, and death. It, um, this dimension is entered into after our natural life without Christ. Revelations explains it well, 20, 13 through 14. The sea and the sea gave up their dead which were in it, the folks that were dead in the water. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So that's telling you that there is a dimension of death and hell. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into where? The lake of fire. To die again. And burn some more. Bruh. Heaven is not the Garden of Eden either. I explain that all. You just have to get, then I explain that in part 12. You got to get part 12 out of darkness because I went in depth on this whole Garden of Eden thing and I, I don't have time to go into it now. It's very important that you see that. But heaven is not the Garden of Eden. Heaven is a realm that still exists today where God is. People say, see, the Bible never said there was no heaven. He said heaven is pagan. Pagan? Jesus ascended to this place, the Bible said, after he died. Where did he go? Where did the, the rich man in hell look up and see Lazarus? God conversed with his sons and Satan came also in the book of Job. This meeting was held in the realm of heaven. John 14 and 2, in my father's house are what? Amen. Are what? Amen. Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. But then he just, ugh. you can't prove text Jesus. Because right after that, he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. If there was not a heaven, if I didn't have another home for you, if there wasn't a realm where the streets are paved with gold and everything is, there's not going to be any more suffering, any more pain. He said, if, if, if all of this was a lie, like Carlton and Tim said, he said, I would have told you. I would have told you. 
But he's telling you right here, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then he said, I go to what? I'm going to get mansions ready for you. Eden was a dimension where God and man dwelled together. When man fell, he lost access to Eden. Oh, man, childhood Bible stories. Genesis 3 and 24, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So, I mean, you can't, man lost access to Eden. Eden was not heaven. Heaven is not pagan like he said. Pagan means of this world. That's all it means. Of this world. So mythical gods of this world are pagan gods. Look at somebody and say, I don't serve a pagan god. Because my god is not of this world. Pagan means of this world. Heaven is not of this world. John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom... What did Jesus say? My kingdom is what? Not of this world. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. Brother, I'm not from here. So don't you say heaven is on earth. I'm back to him. He compared God's Punishment to Hitler compares a God that punishes to Hitler. But how do you make hell worse than sins against other people? If you live in a homosexual lifestyle, you're sinning against other people. You're hurting other people. If you practice an adultery, you're hurting other people. So how do you make hell bad, but what you're doing, okay? Every day that Carlton and others lead people astray through their immorality, pride, and erroneous doctrines, they are hating their brother. John 1, 3, and 15 says, Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath what? Eternal life. Eternal life? What do you mean eternal life? Where is this eternal life? What eternal life? Eternal? So that means as humans we're going to live forever? Like some X-Men? Wolverine? Can't kill us? What eternal life is he talking about? He must be talking about life somewhere else other than here. Because this physical body is not going to last forever. It's too easy. It really is too easy. Hebrews 10 and 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God whose mercy endureth forever. It is a what? A what? A what? Fearful things. The beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. He says that God's moral character of love is not consistent with this type of punishment. God's manifestation of love is Jesus Christ. See, why are we talking about what God wouldn't do? He wouldn't punish people. He wouldn't burn. Let's talk about what he would do. He would manifest his son, send his son to die, to pay the penalty, so none of us have to go to hell. He gave us Christ to keep us from enduring the internal, eternal punishment of hell. His love is manifested by the death of Christ and the payment for our sins. But we must believe on him and receive it in order to experience it. To deny hell and the truth of the Bible is denying Christ. This is Antichrist. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Quit trying to think like me. You can't think like God. How are you going to use your sissy thoughts to describe a real man God? A real God God. The greatest dude ever. And you using your sissy thoughts to try to describe him. Oh, he wouldn't do that. No, he's not that. that. No! He 
He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than earth. Heaven? I thought heaven was on earth. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways what? Higher than your ways. And my thoughts are what? Dude, why are you trying to even use English to describe what I'm going to do? He said, it's the 21st century. It's time to rethink this. No, it's not. <laughs> Only Christians are mean. Mean Christians. I'm, those are the meanest people. Ever. Brother, you haven't been at an LGBT march lately, have you? Have you gotten one of them mad before? Have you gotten mad before? That's what they need to be asking him. The LGBT can, can be vicious and will cuss you out and fight you until the end of you. Then the rappers, remember the Triple X just died this week. I put up a lot of stuff on exministries.com about him. Remember I talked about him in part 12, Out of Darkness, and I read his lyrics. And man, and I, and I even said that these guys don't live long. Remember I said that? And he died at 20 years old this week. But he talked about God so bad, talked about Christians so bad, talked about Christ so bad. I mean, so much, just blasphemy. Satanic. The rappers, the entertainers, Jay-Z and Beyonce's new video. I mean, it's so demonic, you can't even watch it if you say Demon, demons, the atheists, the Satanists, they're always attacking Christ and on the offense. They do not attack any other belief system. But why aren't you mad at Buddha like that? Why aren't you mad at Krishna like that? Why aren't you mad at Allah like that? The church is usually being defensive. We have to keep defending the faith because they're trying to erase it. They're not attacking anything else. Acts 20 and 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Take heed means y'all be on alert. Watch out. Up unto yourselves, meaning the leaders, and all the flock, meaning the church, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, your watchers. Ain't nobody mad at you, brother. I'm just an overseer. I'm watching. I'm taking heed. He said that I feed the church of God, which he hath what? Jesus purchased how? With his own blood. He said that the world has never persecuted him, but the world embraces him. Thank you. Thank you for that. You just told me. You, you really told me a lot. You just spoke volumes, brother. I'm so glad you said that. That made my day. That made my job easier, too. Because all I had to do is, like he said, he's a Bible thumper or whatever he said. I just thumped to John 15 and 9. Somebody thump, y'all thump the John 15 and 9. For if the were, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world what? Thank you. Luke 6 and 26. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. For so did the fathers to who? To who? Who did speak well of? False. Easy, man. I need to give Herman a mic so he could just keep saying easy. All paths ultimately lead to God. He said that. Come on, man. John 14 and 6. Where's a child? Let me have a child come read this. Because Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man does what? Come to the Father, but what? Now, he said there are many ways. Well, he just told you the ways. The way, the truth. That's it. Ain't no other ways. Jesus, then he said Jesus had a little bigotry in him. Yeah, that's, yeah he said that about Jesus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I got a little scared for him. 
Jesus had a little bigotry in him. He didn't understand himself. He said Jesus didn't understand himself because he was just 33. He didn't understand himself. He said, Jesus said, what you see me saying and doing is what the Father God is doing. Uh Uh-oh, wait a minute. What you see me saying and doing is what the Father got. So if Jesus didn't understand himself, are you saying God wasn't understanding himself? He said, I can do nothing except given by my Father. So Carlton, is God fallible? John 8 and 28. Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing, what? Of myself. But as my Father has what? So you're saying God is not, you're saying God is a bad teacher? Because Jesus doesn't understand Himself? He said, no, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. So the only thing I'm speaking is what the Father's saying. Then he compared his age to the age of Christ. And I, I really don't have nothing else to say to that, but just <laughs> devil. Water boy, mm, devil, 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 just devil. <laughs> Dude, just, I don't have nothing else to say. Just devil. Jesus was just 33. I'm 65. Mm, devil. 65-year-old devil. You too old to be this devilish. Wearing an re- earring. When is, what's the age limit for an earring? That's what we need to discuss. Shirt open. Shirt open. Count chocolate. I, I've just, I'm just done. All right, here's the rest of Tim's message, and then I'm going to try to wrap this up. Tim says, I know you've been talking to your grandmama. You've been talking to your auntie. You've been talking to your pastor. And you've been talking to all these religious people who comfort you with vain words. We do, y'all, y'all know this is a demon talking, right? Like, people that even know this guy are like, who was this? They were like shocked. His own family, some of them was like, who is this talking? Oh, it was somebody talking through him, definitely, when he said pastor. You've been talking to your pastor? And he comforts you with vain words? We do it to kids all the time. We want them to shut up. We'll feed them a fantasy. Because I don't want to fix what's wrong with you. I just want you to shut up. So in order to get you to shut up, sometimes I have to feed your imagination, he said. But not once did he mention sound doctrine, righteous living, or God's moral code, which fixes all the issues that plague us. It's not that heaven and hell aren't real. It's that the gospel message of sound doctrine has not been taught. People look past the Bible for the remedy to their issues instead of obeying the Bible's code of morality to prevent these issues. Look at somebody and say, God is preventative. The church don't want to address what's really wrong with you. They just want you to be quiet, sit down, and act nice. Boy, what church are you going to? Churches I went to wasn't nobody quiet. You want a baby to be quiet, just tell them Santa Claus is coming to town. Only until their eyes come open and they realize that Santa Claus has never come to town, he continued, I didn't come to feed you a lie today. I came to feed you the truth. The church isn't working the way it should for many people today, says Rogers, because corruption ensures it only works for the people who run it. Bro, what church are you talking about? Your church? Look at somebody and say, Christ runs the church. Okay, okay. To slam the church like Kurt did a year ago, now he's doing it this year, to slam the church and convince people that the church is not necessary is something that Christ has not sanctioned. You just stepped outside of the Bible to do that, okay? And we can't fit you back in. 
because he died for the church. He already told you that he gave his life and his blood for the church. He died for the church, and then he already judged the church in the book of Revelations. Revelations 2, the seven churches of Asia. He did not do away with the church. He did not stop them at all. He didn't sit the pastor down. He didn't close the doors. He didn't tell them, y'all don't meet anymore. He didn't tell them it's over. Y'all are not necessary. We're going to take it and do it another way. He didn't do any of that. He just asked them to do what? Repent. Brother, you doing away with the church? Christ just asked them to repent. What if we, done a, what if we do away with you? Because you're not right. He asked him to repent. What this man is doing is the work of Satan to discredit the church and God's religion. He urged people to turn to the Bible. Y'all just quit listening to these folks. And so turn to the Bible to learn how to live better instead of worrying about the illusion of heaven and hell. Oh, but the Bible teaches. You tell them to turn to the Bible, but the Bible teaches about hell and heaven. Okay, let's do that. So, do we turn to the Bible or just the pages that you are recommending? God can give you a Bible to send you to hell or heaven. This is what he said. He gave you a Bible to give you instructions. So, what if you don't follow the instructions? Or, what if you do follow the instructions? Let's say this again. Because God did not give you a Bible to send you to heaven or hell. He gave you a Bible to give you instructions. Instructions for what? You can either make your life heaven or you can make your life hell. Look at your neighbor and say, use the instructions. Don't nobody in here do that. <laughs> he gave us his word so we will know him better. This is why he gave us the word. And can make an informed decision on where we want to spend eternity. That's what the Bible's for. Brother, that's what the instructions are for. I mean, do you instruct your children and then not monitor the outcome? You're just going to instruct them and just go, okay, all right then. No, you want to see the outcome. Let me see if they're going to do what I said. I don't believe in a lot of the stuff that the church gave me. I quit. Good. Matter of fact, I don't want church. I want good. I don't want to do church. I want to do good because everybody that's doing church ain't doing good, he said. Most folks who doing good don't even go to church. He explained that the youth today are simply acting out vain imaginations. Is that what they're doing? They just were raised by wolves somewhere and decided to just act on their vain imaginations so parents didn't have nothing to do with this, huh? And publicly repent, then he publicly repented for his role in the church system that feeds fantasy to the masses. Let, I hate when they do this. Let me publicly repent for the whole church. Let me do something that I know half of these ladies and uh, would never have the heart to do. That is to apologize to a generation we've misused and taken advantage of, he said. The problem here is not the church, but the home. Can I really preach? Y'all gonna let me? You cannot repent to youth for what the church has done when it's the parents' responsibility whether they are in church or not. You are not going to make the home the church, bro. This is why the morality issues in the church are the same morality issues that the world has. It's because the church is modeling the world. It's not because the church is ineffective. It's because the people in the church are ignoring their immorality. And that's everywhere. Brother, you leave church, you're going to see immorality. He also repented to his daughter publicly for giving up on her. So now we know what all of this was about. Religion will have you judging people without really trying to find out what's wrong with people. Religion will do that? Really? How did you get like this? What's on your mind? Who did this to you, he said. Okay, let me, let me, let me bring clarity to this, please. Religion does not do this. Religiosity does. It's a big difference. 
Acting religious is not the same as religion. Religion is the belief. Acting re religious is you trying to prove it by your works and abilities. It's not the same thing. When a person acts religious, they, the Bible says, strain out the net and swallow the camel. Meaning that they, you know, the, the religious stuff is, you know, they see pants and makeup and they say you shouldn't be wearing that. and you did it, But they ignore the sin in the life of the person. The real problem that Jesus Christ has come for. But pure religion, according to the Bible, which is of God, does exactly what this man and Kurt Franklin said it can't do. It takes care of the fatherless generation by protecting them from fatherlessness. And it keeps them unspotted from the world or the world's attack on God's kingdom. Tim Rogers, Kurt Franklin, Carlton Pearson are trying to make religion evil. And this is antichrist and satanic. Matthew 7 and 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of what? Is this heaven on earth? Is this heaven? Where, where, where is this? They're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my father, which is where? Okay, so it just told you where the kingdom of heaven is because the father is there. Many will say to me in that day, what day? Judgment day. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name? Or like he said back when I used to cast out devils, have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. And Jesus said, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Ever. When you was doing Azusa, I didn't know you. I've never known you. People knew you. TV knew you. TBN loved you. But I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And Revelation 14 and 11 says the smoke of their torment ascended up how long? How long? Forever and ever and they have no rest day nor that don't sound like burning trash to me brother. And all these scriptures deal with hell. The Bible warns us that hell is everlasting. It's everlasting fire in Matthew 18 and 8. Everlasting punishment in Matthew 25 and 46. Everlasting chains in Jude 1 and 6. Everlasting damnation, Mark 3 and 29. Ever, uh, eternal judgment, uh, Hebrews 6 and 2. Eternal fire, Jude 1 and 7. And on and on and on. The Bible is clear. There is a hell. But being born again is accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. This means that we accept the truth of his word, his way, and his whole truth about. Being born again is accepting the truth about everything that Jesus said. John 10 and 9 says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be what? Saved from what? Saved from what? What are you saved from? You saved from sin, but then you, you do sin. So what are we saved from? We're saved from eternal punishment. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. Summary! This is not about how we feel or what we think God will do. This is about sin and punishment for choosing our way instead of God's. Right? The sin of man cannot go unpunished. The wages of sin is death, eternal death. When we sin during our lifetime, we accrue a debt that lasts forever. This is why Jesus came. God has given us a way to escape the eternal flames of hell. The way, the truth, and the life is in Jesus Christ. When we accept him as our personal savior, the penalty for our eternal debt is paid. And we have eternal life through him, with him. Any man that does not believe that Jesus, is, Jesus Christ's death came to pay this penalty and purchase our soul out of eternal punishment is a deceiver. And they minimize the work of the cross. Okay. 
Je this is the logical part, God's logic. Jesus did not just defy physical death. But he defied the spiritual death of eternal punishment and paid that price for us. Y'all got that? We will all, what? We will all physically die. So how could Jesus' death be about saving us from physical death? That is absurd. There, look at somebody say, it has to be more to it. It's about the spiritual death and the eternal price of sin. Jesus is the Christ or Savior from hell. What else is he saving you from? If the wages of sin is death, is the wages of sin physical death or spiritual death? Spiritual death. So if the wages of sin is spiritual death, then what is he a Savior of? He's life. All of this happens after physical death. What are we, look at somebody say, what are we talking about here? Jesus is the Christ or the Savior from hell. This is why the scripture says that Antichrist do not believe that he is the Christ. They don't believe he's the Christ to save you from hell. Tim Rogers, Carlton Pearson, and others that do not believe that Christ saves us from eternal punishment are what? Antichrist. There's a story that Jesus told. Wasn't a parable because he used real people and real names, real places and everything. This is not a parable. Luke 16, 22, he says, and it came to pass, there was a rich man and a beggar. He said, it came to pass, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, which represents heaven. The rich man also died and was just, he was just buried. But in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being what? Was, is this burning trash? And he seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus, where? In his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented, where? In this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art what? Tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he will testify to them, lest they also come into this place of what? Torment. Abraham said, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, man, you know they're not going to hear them. He said, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. And Abraham said, no, nah, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Hell, in this passage that I just read, verse 23, is Hades. In early classical literature, Hades was a term for the place of the departed spirits. This is where they get the whole, it's, it's pagan because of the parallels. Remember I talked about the parallels in part five, how all the mythology stories parallel the true story of Christ and all of that. And so they had their heaven and hell. They had Hades. Hades was actually a mythical character in Greek mythology. He was the antithesis brother of Zeus. Y'all remember that, right? So this is classical literature. That's why they say it's a fairy tale and it's, you know, it's pagan. No, they just used Hades, but the word Hades is a biblical term. In early classical literature, Hades was a term for the place of the departed spirits. But in the Lex, which is uh, the LXX, which stands for the uh, Septuagint, it represents the Hebrew show, the realm of the dead. 
And that occurs 10 times in the New Testament. Okay, so I, I know Carlton likes this kind of stuff, so let me, let me do this for him. In the New Testament, Hades is never used as the destiny of the believer. Neither is it identified with Gehenna, which is usually connected with fiery judgment, as in Matthew 5.22, Sermon on the Mount, what he was talking about. He said, but here in verse 23 of the passage I just read about the rich man and Lazarus, Hades stands in contrast to the place and state of Lazarus's blessing. The division between the two is what? Absolute and what? 